I'm now joined by Ned Bank Private Wealth, Andrew Simpson, and Russ Hayworth, who is a family business advisor and director of the Quest for Legitimacy, which explores the unique experiences faced by people who come from backgrounds where their parents or their grandparents are really high achievers, highly successful, or perhaps particularly prominent. And unsurprisingly, this can bring a lot of pressure onto the rising generation. And that is what we're going to explore a little bit more now. So Andrew and Russ, welcome. Andrew, give us a little bit of an overview on this. I think it's really fascinating, actually, in terms of the difference between where somebody's parents might have come from and the experiences of their children. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the subject matter essentially focuses on, on the fact that a lot of people within that rising generation of the children within a successful family or prominent family, even though they've had a number of opportunity, you know, huge opportunity provided for them, really do struggle with life. Mm. And in terms of why it's important to acknowledge that is a, a, a big part of the problem is that it's not spoken about and it's not communicated and they have very different views on what that success means, whether you are the now generation, the sort of the people in the driving seat, or whether you're the rising generation, the, the children um, mm. that are coming through behind them. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I suppose when you hear about successful people, often you hear about their humble roots, their, perhaps their working class background, and there's a lot of respect that goes hand in hand with sort of having been able to sort of crash through barriers, social mobility, if you like. So is that a problem for generations who are born into wealth? Because in a way, you're starting from a, from a level that's very different. So where do you go? Yeah, I mean, very often in terms of those people who are entrepreneurial, who start enterprises, start businesses that go on to become successful, that's come from some form of pain or, or trauma, for want of a better mm. phrase, in terms of I want to A, solve a problem, but I also want to be able to put food on the table. Yeah. The fact that it then grows and becomes something that has more significance and more prominence naturally means that any future generations that follow don't necessarily have those same experiences when they're growing up. That's not their fault. They didn't ask to yeah. be born into to these families. But just as a nature of, of um, the success of their um, predecessors means that they're growing up in a completely different environment to those that the parents or grandparents would have grown up into as well. Yeah, as you say, they can't possibly have that lived experience of, I want to get out of this situation, I want to change my circumstances. So what are the main challenges that these children sort of have to face? Mm -hmm. So within our research, we spoke to 25 different rising generation members from around the globe. So what we saw were patterns that existed irrespective of where people were in, um, in terms of their geography. There were some cultural elements depending on part of the world that they came from, but some of the recurring themes that we found mainly was the presence of isolation, that feeling of I'm on my own in this. I don't have anyone that I can talk to about the fact that I have all this opportunity, but often that can lead to a sense of overwhelm yeah. and a sense of how, how do I navigate this because it's I'm in a very fortunate position. I think it's quite important to point out as well that it's not necessarily an inherently overall negative experience growing up in a prominent wealthy family. There's masses of opportunity and really positive elements that come from it. But what our research found is that there is also elements that creates that isolation and that feeling of we had participants, for example, who were the wealthiest person in their particular social circle or in mm. their particular um, class at school or, or whatever the, the sort of social group that they were in. And that brings its own challenges mm. around, you know, uh, are they my friends because they're my friends or are they my friends because of my kind of Because they want prominence. to use my swimming pool yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so there's exactly. that like paranoia perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's understandable. Mm. And Andrew, does this just affect children of the very wealthy? No. In fact, the book is focused on prominence. Um, and with that, the wealth follows. During the last sort of year or so, when I've been speaking to Russ about this particular topic, and when I read the book, it was quite interesting because I was looking at characteristics or, or people that I grew up with whose parents weren't particularly wealthy, but the father may have been uh, hugely academic, and my friend was not. And, yeah. and that was a huge pressure. And what it boils down to is that everyone is on some kind of quest for legitimacy, whether you're wealthy or not, but it has a real magnifying um, effect when it is a, 
uh, from a family with huge mm. wealth or mm. huge prominence. And I think that's the point. So everyone is affected. It's just yeah. it, it becomes a much bigger effect mm. with, with greater prominence. It's yeah, it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because as you say, success and sort of wealth is often going to go hand in hand with having um, a, a big character for a, for a mum or dad, yeah, a big personality. And we'll know, even if you've got children yourself, your children aren't necessarily like you at all. I've got two that are completely different, you know, completely different DNA. Yeah. So I guess it's that assumption of, you, you know, are your children going to have the same tools as you to, to sort of create? What, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, and I, I think j just touching a bit on um, Andrew's point around the, the use of the word prominence. Mm. So Jamie Weiner, who is the psychologist that I work with, who we did all the research, it was his kind of... Um, idea to, to do this research and, and bring it to, to fruition. Um, he's the author of the book, The Quest for Legitimacy, and the subtitle of that is How Children of Prominent Families Discover Their Unique Place, place in the World. Okay. And we use the word prominence very deliberately. Right. Because wealth can create prominence, but also history can pre create prominence. Got it. One of our participants mentioned to us that they were delighted that we'd focused on the word achievement rather than wealth yeah. because the wealth is often the result of the achievement sure but it's the achievement itself how do I live up to that achievement if perhaps I haven't had the same upbringing or if I've had different opportunities if I've been sent to different school systems than my parents had then that that in itself can create what we call the shadow Mm -hmm. which again we naturally has negative connotations but the shadow can be inspiring in terms of how do I cast my own shadow how do I get to that level of prominence myself mm -hmm. but there are others that find that quite intimidating and we spoke to families that were four or five hundred years old and that legacy in itself it wasn't a particular person it was the achievement of the family before them that had created this prominence that they were like how do I live up to those expectations? How do I carry this legacy on? Okay, and how does that sort of manifest itself? How does that play out? Does that mean that perhaps some children who've perhaps come from a very famous family historically or something, might they try and rebel because they're trying to plough their own furrow and sort of find their own identity? So I suppose every child has a choice, don't they? It's like following your parents' footsteps or create something completely different. Mm. Um, so, so again, in terms of the research, there was there was mixed kind of journeys. They all had a pattern. Okay. So all of our participants followed what we would term the four phases of the quest for legitimacy. So the first phase is a phase of awareness, where they become aware that perhaps they have more opportunity. For many of the people we spoke with, that awareness came in retrospect through the talking and discussing it. They look back and go, actually, I am aware of the fact it was different. Uh, uh, a great example is a lady we spoke to whose family were a diamond uh, dealing jewellery family and she learnt to count at five, six years old when her dad bought home diamonds and poured them on the table and helped wow. her count. Yeah. Now looking Most back... Most people have an abacus. Absolutely. So <laughs> looking back, she's able to go, wow, that's a moment of awareness yeah. for me that uh, I've kind of I've had a different upbringing to perhaps that those that are around mm. me. The second phase is then a tug of war, that pull between the world you're being brought up in and the outside world and how you navigate that. The third phase is then what we've termed exploration. I think we'll come on to, to a bit more detail around the importance of that phase um, a little later on. But it's effectively what do you do in order to find your own agency and your own um, sort of legitimacy. Mm. And that's where the fourth phase comes in, which is ownership. And importantly, we don't mean ownership of assets, we mean ownership of your own life. Okay. That feeling of legitimacy, that internal sense of agency, that, yeah. and it's non-linear. So it's, you don't yeah. get to ownership, get a badge, and then you're legitimate for the rest of your life. You can be taken into any of those phases at any given time. Okay, so it's just being comfortable in terms of where you're from and who you are. As you say, it's all an accident of birth, isn't it? It's yeah. very interesting. And I guess in many ways, it's quite a delicate subject as well, isn't it? I think it's very it's a very delicate subject if you've got two different generations in the same room and you start talking about it. It's, it's not actually a very delicate subject. And we found, we did an event recently where we, we brought clients along. Um, from a, a rising gen perspective, it's not a delicate topic. It's actually a huge amount of relief when you start using mm. the language that has come about from the book and the research. They start going, oh my word, it's 
this is such a relief that I am, this is not a unique thing for me. This is, this is very actually quite common for people in my situation. Mm. So there's a huge amount of relief and you can, you can see it on their faces. Um, it's quite emotional. Um, and, and we also, in this particular event, we had the now generation and the, and the rising and, and there was a real disconnect in terms of the, the rising generation felt huge relief that this was a topic and they could talk about it. Whereas the now generation had no concept. All they saw was the opportunity that they'd provided. Interesting. Broadly speaking. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think this is so fascinating. I can totally understand why people might be thinking, I'm so glad you're saying this out loud. And I find that fascinating that as the now generation, they're like, well, I've worked really hard to give everything to you. And perhaps that generation are going, and I'm really grateful, but mm. it doesn't come without its challenges. Yeah, That's to, so interesting. To place that into a bit of context as well, what we believe is that the quest for legitimacy is universal. So it's not just limited to the rising generation. It just so happens we spoke to the rising generation. Mm. Th that has no age bracket. So the oldest person we spoke to within the 25 was 75 years old and they would still consider themselves as rising because they yeah. hadn't got to that point of the, the prominence within their, their own family. Mm. But what we often find as well is that the now generation are unintentionally casting a shadow of expectation. It's not something they're deliberately setting up because they're on their own quest for legitimacy. They are looking at life going, I'm just trying to do the best I can every day to make something a success. Mm. They don't appreciate that those that are seeing that, particularly from a child-parent relationship, is kind of, wow, this person is a giant. They don't have any worries or concerns mm -hmm. themselves. And now I've got this position where I've got to live up to those expectations. Yeah. And it's, it's all unintentional. It's in the room, but nobody's talking about it. Right. And, 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 and that, that, sorry, that's it. That's, it's the lack of communication. Oh. That seems to be the biggest problem from yeah. my limited experience. And, and I understand that that's exactly why this particular topic has generated a lot of interest from Ned Bank private wealth clients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know what, it, a lot of our clients uh, do fit into the, the, the sort of the category that were um, part of the research um, mm. and the book. So absolutely, it, it, it's a fascinating topic and it's one that's not really been spoken about. Mm. Right. So is there anything that we should be looking out for? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we obviously we off the back of some really interesting events we've done this year so far. Um, we're looking to do a number of events with Russ, some of which we've spoken about, some of which I'm Are you going hoping on to tour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if, Russ, if Russ will. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's lots, lots planned for this year coming up. It's a huge topic. We've barely scratched the surface, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. yeah interesting. I, I think it's fascinating. And it is probably not something that many of us would have really thought about before. But anything that gets people talking can't be a bad thing. So thank you so much to both of you. It was really, really interesting. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.